It is finished in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the most difficult homily to give during the course of the year because the liturgy of Good Friday is so wonderfully rich and says so much, you wonder what more you can possibly add to it. So I'm not going to try to say very much. I will say one thing. When you're in college, or at least when I was in college, everyone learns that Friedrich Nietzsche said that God is dead, or that someone purportedly quoted that he said that. We read him we did not read, unless you were in the right classes, the Gospel according to St. John. And it's occurred to me since then many times, in fact, it occurs every year at about this time, that Nietzsche must not have appreciated or perhaps even experienced a Good Friday liturgy, because God is dead is not only old news, it's part of the good news. And of course, when they teach it in philosophy and in other secular classes, what they're really talking about is belief in God, which is far from the same thing. Good Friday is about the death of God. Good Friday is about God incarnate, born of a woman born in history, born within God's holy covenanted people, God coming into the story that he himself wrote, and himself dying. That's only possible that God, the creator of all things, should die by the incarnation. The incarnation is God limiting himself by being born a man. God's self-limitation of himself to human personhood and thus taking on himself from the very moment of his conception, the possibility of death. And what a death. Our Lord doesn't merely die. God incarnate, the author of the story, comes into the story to be among his people, and not just his covenanted people, Israel, but his people of Rome, who by some miracle have managed to conquer much of the Mediterranean world and to at least begin to bring some sort of peace and order to it. But of course they do that with the same sort of brutality that is our fallen condition. There is not yet any kind of redemption. So God comes into the world 
to be betrayed and to be spat on and to be betrayed by those closest to him. In a sense, Judas Iscariot stands in for all humanity. He is the one who does the deed, but it is the people of Israel and the people of Rome, church and state, if you will, acting in concert that effect that betrayal. In other words, it's everybody. It is all the powers that be in the age in which our Lord walked the earth. They turn on him and they see too his crucifixion and God uses this. This is the real and remarkable, miraculous story and why we call this dark day nonetheless good. God uses everything wrong with his creation as the means and mechanism of redeeming that creation. What happens to Jesus on this day, the torture, the execution, all of the mocking and the betrayal that runs through it. You know, betrayal is that sin that pours salt in an already open wound. The fact that those you love have put you in this situation have led you to this horrible moment. It just adds insult to the injury. But it is through all of that, through the worst that can happen to any of us and then some, through the death of God, that God effects our redemption. It, as if, it is as if he is saying to us, the worst that can happen to you, I have come and shared. The worst that can happen to you, I also have borne on myself. I have taken it on. I have walked the way of this cross with you even unto death. That's what Isaiah said God would do. And the incarnation is the answer as to the question how. How God will do this. And in walking to that cross, in holding out his arms to the executioner to be nailed onto it, God has opened his arms to everyone who has suffered anything for any reason through all of history to this present moment and into the unseeable future. He has opened his arms to all and said, I share your worst pain on your worst day. I am with you as not only your creator and maker, but as your brother sufferer, your equal and your friend. And the death of God comes with the words from the cross, it is finished. The it to which the Lord refers is the work of redemption, the hard part, the part that in Gethsemane he prayed the Father might spare him. That was not to be. It often isn't to be that we are to be spared from the sufferings that time and sin inflict on us. But this day, this death of God, 
is so important because it is the prelude to the rescue. You can't have Easter morning without Good Friday. There is no redemption without suffering. Indeed, there is no life, no new life without death. As God has died for us, we pray in those stations of the cross, let us die loving thee. Let us die to ourselves and our sins, that we may be born again to new life. The resurrection is coming for this moment. We focus on the cost of it, the death of God, and we meditate and we pray and we join our sufferings to his, knowing that when he comes again, we will say, as he has said this day, It is finished, and unlike him, we will mean that there will be no more suffering. All our sufferings will have ended, and there will be only light and life, and it will be more like when a king dies, and the crowds say the king is dead, long live the king. Our king is dead. Long live our king. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.